I gave a talk on Friday in Edinburgh and my title was What If There Were No Surgeons? And I was describing the story of a 52-year-old called Amira who is wearing a biotech wearable and actually it notices that something's wrong with her physiology. So she then books into the diagnostic platform. The diagnostic platform shows she's got a coronary plaque. She then books in because actually there's a human in the loop, but the AI algorithm suggests what should be the treatment. And the treatment is that you inject nanobots that go in, crunch up the park, put some anti-inflammatories into the area, and then she's got a virtual assist that says, you need to be doing more exercise now. And I think there is a world that is coming that does that. Hello and welcome to The Connection, where RL Datix's Chief Customer Officer Liz Jones and Medical Director Darren Kilroy are joined by leaders and colleagues from within the healthcare industry. In The Connection, we explore how people and technology in healthcare can come together to create great experiences and support patient safety. We hope you enjoy listening. We're really delighted uh, that, Stella, you've joined us on the podcast today. Uh, We'll let you introduce yourself, Stella, because we'll let our guests introduce themselves in their own inimitable ways. So, um, Stella, tell us a little bit about who you are and why you're here. So, I'm a vascular and general surgeon based down in Croydon. Um, And I'm not sure I should say that anymore because I now do one session a week, which is clinical, and the rest of it is for NHS England um, as National Clinical Director for Elective Care and then National Medical Director for Quality and Clinical Effectiveness, uh, looking at secondary care, really, Um, and love all my jobs. Brilliant. How did you uh, come into these different roles? How did it all start for you to get involved in all the central roles? You know, there's always that quote from Richard Branson, which says, if someone asks you to do something, just say yes and then learn how to do it. Um, I've never had a problem saying yes. I'm dreadful at saying no. Um... But I, I do things because I want to make a difference. It's, it's, it's the conversation you're taught not to say at your medical school interview, but genuinely, that's what I'm about. Yeah. Um, and I think my, my kids have inherited it from, for, from me. Um, but it's not about empires. It's not about power. It is very much if I can help and make a difference, I'll roll my sleeves up and get on with it. Really, and that's that's um, that's exactly why we wanted to talk to you. So, um, if we could take right back in terms of those early decisions, um, and and you know how you decided to go into medical school, and had you got family who were, were that's no. So, what can you talk us through that? And 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 again, we're thinking. We know we've got lots of listeners who are thinking about this as a career path. For sure. And we're we're also interviewing some people who are like year one. Yeah, med, med students yeah. or all kinds so, of people. So, yeah, yeah. So just knowing your story, I think would be really interesting. So I'm going to take you right back. I'm taking you back to 1966. Daddy arrived from India. Uh, Mum arrived not long afterwards. Um, and then there are three of us that were born. Um, and the conversation in the household was very much, you can do things on a background of everyone telling you you can't. So at school, I was told I should be a social worker. Um, but when I was about four or five, I'd gone out to India and I met my grandmother uh, on my my mum's um, side and her sister. She'd just lost her eyesight because she'd had cataract surgery that had not uh, worked in the way that people thought. And apparently this precocious little thing said, that's not a problem. I'm going to become an eye surgeon and I will fix you. And that's where it came from. Uh, and and I, I didn't waver from it apart from at medical school realizing that I didn't like eyes. They, they're, they're just not solid organs, you know, they're just not. Um, and so, but the, the conversation about being a surgeon was, was always there. Um, And then you meet people through your lives that make a difference. So um, I worked for Kieran Horgan, who was one of my my first consultants, um, my first bosses as a houseman. Um, And it was Christmas that year. And he said, you know, Dr. Vig, as he called me, Dr. Vig, you know, what are you going to do? What's going to be your your career trajectory? And I decided I'd do medicine because there were no other female surgeons in Wales. And it, there were no other female surgeons. Well, there was one. There was one in um, Chester, who is brilliant, but not the kind of female surgeon I wanted to be. Um, 
And there was, there was one registrar, sadly she passed with survivor cancer, who I got to know quite well. Um, but no, I mean, I mean, even now there are only 16% of female consultants, you know, consultants in, in surgery are female. So uh, anyway, he said, you need to reach for the stars, have a go and do it. And if you don't get there, at least you tried. But if you don't, you'll never know. And genuinely, it was that conversation that made me determined to be a surgeon. So for wow. anyone listening, well, there's a out, moment on a the moment, external microphone. Moment, and it sort of responded to Stella's visionary statement there. It blew the system. But I think one of the things that people keep saying now is if you don't see it, you can't do it. And, and you know, I really want to break that because if you think about the boss of Google or, you know, Amazon, they didn't see it. They went in and did it. And I think for anyone listening on the call now, yes, look for role models because they're important. Yeah. But don't be scared to follow your dreams. Yeah, for yeah. sure. So if there aren't any, then then be the, be the role model. Be the role model. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But I really love what you said as well, though, which is about, it's about also those moments where you meet people that the, give you... You just change your direction. They change you? your direction. Well, have you, have you, you had that in your, in your career? Y yeah, not to that. Not to that powerful degree. I mean, I, none of my family went to med school. They're all nurses. All my family were nurses and midwives and mental health nurses. I was the only one to go to medical school, the only one to go to university. So I, I, I met various people along the medical school path who changed my thinking about what, he, what, what a guy from a council estate in North Manchester could do, you know, because their aspirational bar was very low for, for people in my, my neighbourhood. So there would have been people, I can't think of their names now, but it were people, you know, who definitely changed my thinking about what you could achieve. Uh, you, you, you need those people. And uh, it'd be interesting, we're talking to a medical student in a couple of weeks' time on the podcast, a female medical student, and, and how, the, how the generations change. I want the expand. I haven't got time to talk about it now, but how things are different now compared to yours and mine, you know, undergraduate days. And you, you still need that inspirational kick from people, don't you, to, to give you the dream. And, you know, I think there is a change and people keep saying, oh, we need to go back to, and I don't think we do. Uh, if you think of even, you know, pre-COVID and now, people are working in different ways. People's life expectations are different. Um, and we just need to support people now in the future. Yeah. Um, but there are things, so um, I think the conversation of compassion, curiosity, uh, making sure, you know, our world, we're doctors, our world is clinical. Our world is about people and patients. And I genuinely believe that if you listen to your patients with intent two things one is you'll get the diagnosis without the need of lots of diagnostic tests but two you really need to listen to what matters to them because i think they are worried about bringing up the conversations they really need to have and you need to give them permission and you don't do that with tell me you do that with your body language and you know, it's the non-verbal. What, what do you think about the way that AI will play it? I mean, we're all talking about AI at the moment, and I know it's not new, but we're talking about it a lot. Uh, where do you see AI has a role in, in, in enabling us to contextualise the patient because it's tracking more things about them, that it makes it easier to volunteer stuff? You know, um, it's an interesting thought, isn't it, about how that will help us with diagnosis and management and the interactions. It's really interesting. So I, I gave a talk on Friday in Edinburgh, and... Um, my title was, What If There Were No Surgeons? And I was describing the story of a 52-year-old called Amira who is wearing a biotech wearable and actually it notices that something's wrong with her physiology. So she then books into the diagnostic platform. The diagnostic platform shows she's got a coronary plaque. She then books in because actually there's a human in the loop, but the AI algorithm suggests what should be the treatment? And the treatment is that you inject nanobots that go in, crunch up the plaque, put some anti-inflammatories into the area, and then she's got a virtual assist that says, you need to be doing more exercise now. But she lives, where, whereas her mother died at 62. And I think there is a world that is coming that does that. But I also heard a, a wonderful uh, conversation, which I understand is going into print shortly, where two medical students uh, were on their mental, um, in their block, looking at patients with mental health needs. Um, and what they did was they did their interpretation of a, a mental health um, clinical consultation, but they had an AI in the room that was doing the same, and it was prompting them to the questions they should be asking. And then they stood back at the end and actually compared. And the learning from that was so enriching because they had something that was 
helping them with a world of experience in the room, but not being intrusive to the patient. Yeah. And I, and I think it, it's the way to be, but there is another thing. I asked ChatGPT to do me some visuals of the future surgeon. So the first visual it gave me was of a white male surgeon in scrubs, surrounded by scientific formulae. So I wrote in quite angrily and said, do you know that there are not very many female surgeons? And, and, and. Um, and I said, right, can you now draw me a vision of a female future surgeon? Well, it drew me almost the same picture, but two things. One, obviously, it was a female surgeon. But secondly, the background had changed completely from scientific to being about clinical order and quality. And I thought, incredible, the data we're feeding in. The bias is built into it. That's right. I actually think that's where the health service here has got an advantage over almost every other part of the world. Because together with the Federated Data Platform, we will, in a way, be able to have some control over the data that then become. So rather than using, you know, generic um, chat, yeah. we'll hopefully be able to get people using something that's a much more controlled version. And hopefully people are working on the bias because it's absolutely writ large within it. But it's definitely the future and it's where, you know, we know in schools and in, you know, medical schools, one is the people that are coming in are going to be digitally enabled. So we need to support them to do more. But secondly, we need to be teaching how to use these things really well. I'm grateful for your time. We're out of time. I mean, I know. You, you, we, you've we got might, lots of calls um, on your time, but we should, we should go back to this. Yeah, I'd love, love to bring you back at some point and talk a little bit about um, also balance with life and how you make that work. Because I know that you've got lots of other interests as well as um, four jobs, I think I counted actually in chapter. <laughs> Just before you go, Stella, one quick killer question. What's your favourite vascular procedure? Oh, a carotid endotomatomy. It's the most beautiful, most precise, but actually you change people's lives. A, you can get rid of the plaque and they're wonderful, but you can also cause a stroke that is life destroying. And so, but it, yeah, no, it's just the most wonderful operation in the world. There you go. Brilliant. What a great way what to end. What a great way to end it. Absolutely. That's fantastic. Thank you for joining us on today's episode of The Connection. We hope this episode has provided you with valuable insights on the role that both technology and people play within the healthcare landscape. For more information and resources, visit rldatix.com. Don't forget to subscribe to The Connection on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or any other podcast platform you use. Join us next time as we continue to explore how healthcare is impacted by connecting people and technology. On behalf of the RL Datix team, thanks for listening.